Hey, true believers, do you love politics? Do you love comic books? Well, superhero politics is for you. Combines the comical nature of politics and the political nature of comic books. Join us, like, share, and experience the world of comics and politics in a way that you never have before. This is superhero politics. And I'm your host, Michael Holmes. Welcome to Superhero Politics, folks, and this is episode nine, and I am stoked because it is all about my guy. It is all about Kal-El of Krypton, the greatest superhero of all time, the GOAT, Superman. And the reason why I wanted to do this episode today is because there has been a bunch of awesome Superman related news and some pretty thought provoking stuff as well um, so guys if you guys have been out there watching um, you know that the Zack Snyder epic four hour Justice League uh, debuts uh, in a couple of days and it'll be on HBO Max and Um, You know, in that we'll see, you know, black suited Superman. We'll see all those scenes that were cut that we were expecting in the um, in the original version before um, Joss. He shall not be spoken of. Whedon um, got got his hands on it. Um, And so we're going to see, you know, you know, some some, you know, Superman footage that we have been sorely lacking obviously um there's been no plan for you know man of steel 2 there's been no um uh, update you know for for that particular uh standalone superman movie but in its absence um we've gotten some pretty good other stuff you know we've got some other stuff that came up um we've got uh superman lois who you know debuted premiered on the cw and it is you know, pretty good, pretty good so far. So far, so good. I mean, it's um, Tyler Hecklin and Bitsy Tulloch star as, um, you know, Clark Kent slash Superman in Lois Lane. And, you know, they've moved back to Smallville. They've, you know, quit the Daily Planet and um, or was fired from the Daily Planet, got quit. And they, they took, which is the new twist, um, their two sons. Jonathan and Jordan and they've moved them back to the Kent farm um, Ma Kent has recently passed away so there's no more parental Kents which seems odd because at least in every almost every iteration there's been at least one of them around there's um, you know even if you go back to you know the the you know, Lois and Clark days, you know, there was both the Kents were alive and then you had, you know, the, um, you know, the Christopher Reeve films. I mean, there, you know, the, the mom was around, Martha was still alive. And then even, you know, in the, um, DCEU films, there was, Martha was still there. So, I mean, there was, um, always, 
you know, uh, an elder Kent, I should say. This is this is a little different because this time there's there's none. Like they're the parents, they're the elder Kents, and so now you know you know Clark and Lois are the elder Kents, and now they're raising these two sons, one of which you know to to date has displayed um, you know these burgeoning superpowers. So we've got you know Superman and Lois is off to a great start with some you know really interesting twist uh kind of combining the cw stories um from the crisis on infinite earths and elseworlds um possibly combining these stories in a way that some of the other shows haven't done so um if you think back to uh elseworlds there there was a um you know earth x where you know kara supergirl um green arrow uh, at the time, they were all, you know, Nazis, and so um, then you had the Crisis on Infinite Earths that kind of introduced the full multiverse and um, its destruction, and that's where you saw Superman play a prominent role. Um, Tyler Hecklin's Superman play a prominent role, and um, kind of introduced and previewed this new show. And so at the end of that, you had the collapse of the multiverse, and then all the heroes kind of put together retconned onto a single earth and this is the earth prime now and so now uh, supergirl flash marshman hunter superman all exist on the same earth the black lightning all on the same earth so um that's 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 one superman news um the next one uh, is that Supergirl has been cast? We found our Kara Zor-El. She has uh, been cast in the upcoming Flash movie. She'll debut there, uh, and it is the lovely and talented Sasha Cali, uh, who is an actress on Young and the Restless, one of the daytime soap operas. Um, she's Colombian American, and. Uh, um, so yeah, that's that's a departure from Melissa Benoist, who's been our Supergirl that we've known for the last six years. So that's another news out of the House of L. And so what's happening in the world of uh, comic books? You have uh, the Else World. You have I'm sorry. You have the Future State comic. Um, one side of those one um, title out of that is you have you know the House of L. You have um, Kal El and future, um, you know, future version of him um, with uh, descendants uh, around him. You have also, um, you know, back on Earth, uh, you have John Kent, who's grown up to become the Superman of that of of Earth. But what's really driving this episode and um, Sasha Kelly's casting dovetails into that is the probably the biggest news out of the house of L uh, or about the house of L is that uh, JJ Abrams is looking to reboot Superman now the ominous silence is how he's going to do it so there's a, a a bunch of rumors out there because of the writer that he's bringing on to pen this new Superman, and it's Ta-Nehisi Coates. So for those of you who are familiar with Coates, um, he did one of the most epic Black Panther runs in in all of comic book history. I mean, it was just it was it was great. Uh, he's a fantastic writer. Um, he's a, you know, he's an academic. He's um, writes primarily on race in America and the history of race and um, uh, diversity and and racial equity. And so, some people are afraid that now, because the talk is that Superman will be black. Dun 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 dun. So, um, 
so now this kind of leads us into our full discussion for this episode, and this is the super politics of inclusion. Like, we've seen these things before. These are not new. Um, the reason why this is kind of, you know, raised such a furor is because of a couple of reasons. One, and this is the one that I agree with, is that um, Henry Cavill deserves another movie. He has been fantastic as as Superman. He's been great at the character. Like absolutely great. You know, he looks the part, he's you know, he sounds the part, he's you know, put in the work. You know, Man of Steel is one of my favorite movies. It's was epic. Um and and even if you have watched the first couple of episodes of Superman and Lois, some of the fight scenes, the aerial fight scenes um, were kind of an homage to the Man of Steel. It's just really great, um, really great effects and really great. Uh, um, this is really great visuals uh, for that movie, and people don't want to see him go. But he may be done, you know, as a character. They haven't been able to find a way to integrate him in. They haven't been able to find a way to create a good story around this character I mean they say Superman is hard to write for I don't necessarily but I don't buy that but you know Ta-Nehisi Coates coming in obviously makes people concerned that what we're going to see is another social justice superhero movie not just a you know superhero movie but a, you know a social justice Superman movie and so um, <clears throat> some people are said that you know they don't want to see um, another character racially bent and yeah I can understand certain characters to where their history and their race are so central to the character that you don't want to do it like you know some of the uh, you know and I would say if you don't want toxicity in your life don't go on some of the, the discussion boards and look in the look in the comment sections like you the world is depressing enough. Like you don't want to do that. Like that's not that's not how you want to spend your time. And, you know, unfortunately for me, because of the nature of this podcast and also the nature of the fact that you know I deal every day with politics, I kind of have to live in this world. You don't have to. Like this is this is your choice. You can you can choose to stay out. But you know, in a lot of ways, um, those comment sections are a microcosm of our society today. Like it it kind of reflects what people think and they feel and they want to say, but don't necessarily have the courage or opportunity to say it in public. But if you go into those comment sections, you will see why this is so controversial. But, you know, there are some characters that you really can't touch. You know, like the obvious pushback you're going to get from some of these yahoos is, well, what if what if they uh, turned Black Panther into White Panther? Uh, no. <laughs> no, even though it has happened. I mean, Steve Rogers did, for a brief period of time, put on the you know Black Panther costume uh, to sub in for T'Challa while he was recovering from something. Uh, I, I can't remember, but I remember vaguely that this happened. But it's seminal to the character. Black Panther is seminal. It's, it's his origin story is seminal to the character. Like, you know, f- king of a, a fictional, technological advanced society with the most valuable element on the planet. They're seeking to protect it, to hide it from you know the the colonizations and coloniz- colonizers and imperialists who would take it and use it to wage war. You know, not only that on the world. Like, I get it. Another character that has been talked about being um, racially bent was Magneto. And I am absolutely 100% against that. Even though, even though they are talking about the incredible Giancarlo Esposito taking over the role of Eric Lyncher. Now, if you know who Giancarlo Esposito is... Um, if you watch the boys recently, 
he plays the role of Stan Edgar, who is the CEO, the big, you know, guy at Vought. Um, and he's a phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal actor. He is incredible in everything that he's been in. Even if, even if we were to get Giancarlo Esposito as Magneto, I would not want to change the character. Why, you say? It's because Magneto's origin story is so seminal to the character. And plus, I wouldn't want to be part of the erasure of a Jewish character from comics. Now, I know what you're saying is that, wait a minute, you just said, and you were just kind of going after this other group. No, 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 no. And I say this because as we look at broader representation in society and in, and in, in, in media and in art, they're okay. White people are fine. There is no shortage of white representation in any of these genres. Black and Jewish, not so much. So if you look at Magneto, whose powers manifested, his X gene kicked in um, during the Holocaust, which is one of the greatest atrocities to ever be committed in humanity, and his response to it, and his retaliation to it, I would say, you know, his Jewish identity is, you know, a, a, a it's a foundational aspect of who the character is and why the character does what he does and believes what he believes and acts the way he acts. You know, you can't take this same, you can't take that same experience and apply it with another race of, of people because it didn't happen to everybody. That's just like you couldn't ask, you know, um, Gary Oldman to play a slave. You know, you couldn't ask, you know, you know, somebody like Al Pacino to play a slave. Why? It doesn't fit. And so there are certain characters with these foundational pillars of of what the character is and who the character is that, that can't be changed. As much as I love Superman, and I do, he's my favorite character of all time, this crest is a mantle. Like, it's a mantle. Like, it's... it's Anybody can, can put this on if they have enough power and be Superman. I know it's tough to say about, you know, my favorite character, but... It, it is. It's a mantle. Like we've seen people wear it all the time. I mean, everybody from you know John Henry Irons to um, Shazam, um, Lex Luthor. There have been different iterations of this, and this is why the the idea that Coach is going to come in and and wipe out our traditional white farm boy Clark Kent is ridiculous. And even if, and and that, and I don't even think that's going to happen because, you know, we've seen, we've had this broach before. We've had this subject broached before, um, back in two thousand six when they made Superman Returns, with Brandon Routh. Um, Will Smith was asked to lead that movie, and he turned it down. He was like, Nah, like, can't mess with white people's characters like that then he went on to do Hancock which you know uh, yeah but he turned it down because that character the identity of that character to white America he felt like he couldn't mess with it so you have Ta-Nehisi Coates coming in um, to pin this particular um, version of 
Superman, and the speculation is that it won't be um, a racially bent Clark Kent. It will be uh, one of the other uh, more known versions of Superman, and there there are a few that are African American or or black, and it might be Val Sod of of, of Earth Two or Earth Twenty Eight Calvin Ellis, who is a you know homage to combination of Barack Obama and um, Muhammad Ali, where he serves not only as the Superman of that Earth, but also the President of the United States. Now, that would be something to see on screen. But, um, and, you know, Michael B. Jordan was asked, because he's been kind of bandied around as who would be the, the black Superman. And he was asked about it himself. Oh, I heard that you were asked to to play Superman. And he was like, yeah, but I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to touch that character. Like, I'll do the Calvin Calvin Ellis version. I'll do that version. But I won't do Clark Kent. And, you know, this this story of um, Clark Kent, you know, as the all-American, you know, white farm boy from from Kansas, leads us into our discussion on representation. Now, um, the reason why this is getting such blowback and getting such pushback is because as we see diversity change in our country, and we start to see things that have been traditionally known of as 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 areas of whiteness. Um, these things are starting to diversify a little bit. And it's just not happening here. It's happening around the world. I mean, you look at countries like Sweden and you look at countries like, you know, the Scandinavian com- countries, and they're having immigration come in and you're starting to see more diversity there. Um, recently, we had a huge scandal in the royal family in, in Great Britain where Meghan Markle, who was married to Prince Harry, and Meghan Markle is biracial, She's recently just laid them to bear, like, yo, they are like super fucking racist, like super racist, and so um, they had questions about what her introduction to the gene pool was going to do to the lineage, and you know, looking at some of them, it can only make it better. It can only improve it, but it's areas like that that. Um, have been traditionally known as white that serve as a proxy for racial identity, uh, especially in this country. Especially in this country, because what we have is we have, um, you know, I'm almost 50 years old. And my entire life, I grew up loving, playing, watching and being heroes that didn't look like me, that rarely looked like me, if any. I mean, like I said, I'm 50 years old, and I have seen up until, you know, recent years, to probably the last decade, I've seen Luke Cage, Storm, Jon Stewart, you know, Falcon, and all these, uh, let's see, um, uh, you know, Black Vulcan, Black, you know, which is now kind of slash Black Lightning, um, but that's it, man. Like, that was it. Like, for most of my 50 years, it's been like five heroes. It's been like five heroes. Now, obviously, there have been, you know, versions in the books that I've read over the years. But, like, as mainstream characters, there hasn't barely been any. You know, Hispanic characters in in Asian characters, uh, you know, Jewish characters, even fewer and far between. So... You know, it's time now that the fictional world of comic books start to look like the real world of America. And it seems as though the one place where we feel like this could be an area that wouldn't be contra- controversial, it can't be. Like, it, it, it's still controversial. Like, race in this country and racial representation is a proxy for what we see as um, 
you know, overrun. So you look at what's happening. You see um, immigration happening in this country. You see uh, traditional uh, areas where white people have been dominant for the inception of this, since the inception of this country. We've, you know, black president, black female vice president, um, you know, female you know, female GMs in sports, like these things are happening. And the fact that we see um, that in the world of politics, that these things are often seen as a zero sum game. And, you know, the, the oddity of this is that recently in a Supreme Court case that's been argued before the Supreme Court, the Republican Party is introducing 253 new laws to limit access to the voting rolls. Now, they'll say it's because of fraud. Now, the funny thing is, the only thing they consider fraud is when they lose an election. But, they're introducing these things because minorities have now shown up to represent themselves at the levels that we should have been doing the whole time. Unfortunately, that never works out well for the Republican Party. So now they're trying to limit minority access to the ballot box. Because what they say is, okay, now we look at this fact that the more African Americans that show up, the more Latinos that show up, the more Asians that show up, the more Native Americans that show up, more than likely, they're going to start to elect people that look like them. Therefore, diversifying the people who make decisions about what we do in this country. And in that mind, in their estimation, if we have people in this country that make decisions that don't look like us, they won't make decisions that are in our favor. So they see it as a zero-sum game. That diversity and and inclusion are a zero-sum game that if other people are included, therefore white people must be excluded. And it's stupid, man. Like, it's just dumb. Like, just because it what it does is it, order, it, it it otherizes us. It makes us seem alien. It makes us seem like we're from Krypton. And like, this is why I think that this story has received the type of pushback that it has been receiving. Is because this is almost like the Blue Marvel story. Like, it's almost like the Blue Marvel story, and this is why it's so intriguing to me even though I love this character and I, I have ever since I could read and part of me is like hey Henry Cavill deserves you know two or three more movies but part of me is saying you know what I really love to see how you t- how you retell this story why because imagine the fear and suspicion that America has of just regular black people like the regular black people that can't shoot lasers out of their eyes or fly or pick up a building like we're just regular black people who can't drive down the street or sell water or go to the pool without suspicion imagine what the world would think if some black dude showed up with all these powers how would the white world react that's why I'm interested in the story because I'm I'm interested in how they're going to tell it and what era they're going to set it in. Because imagine Black Superman showing up in 1963. Imagine Black people Black Superman showing up in the middle of the civil civil rights movement. That the first time he's seen in public is rescuing Dr. King from getting assassinated. Bro, like imagine that. So if you see this happening, like imagine, like the story that you could tell. That's why I'm. That's why I'm so intrigued by this. But all in all, if you look at the politics of inclusion, like, is there any place that's off limits? Is there any place? Where black people can be represented 
that's not going to piss off white people. Like, is there anywhere? Like, man, this is fiction. This is the world of fiction. This is a make-believe. Superman ain't real. Superheroes aren't real. Not in the way that we're talking about them. We write these stories. These comic books are written from the vantage point that there are multiple, infinite, trillions of versions of Earth that exist. You can't imagine, white folks, that there's one place where Superman might be black. Or that superheroes might be black. You can't imagine that. That's too hard for you to deal with. Are you that fragile? That seeing Superman on screen with black skin, where he's traditionally been white, that's going to push you over the edge? Like, it's ridiculous. I mean, I get it. A lot of changes happen in the world of comic books in terms of race and representation. I mean, we've got a black Batman right now. Luke Fox. You know, Bruce Wayne is still there. He's doing something else, but the main Batman is black. You know, future state, we have a Brazilian Wonder Woman. Even though she was Greek before, I mean, come on. And I don't really see a whole bunch of people complaining when they changed Aquaman to Jason Momoa. Matter of fact, (laughs) I didn't really hear the complaints. Um, But when you get to this point of when every single thing becomes a proxy for whether or not your existence matters, then you got to start to question like how you are really perceived in our society. Because there's got to be some space, guys. Like There's got to be some space, some creative space to where we can reimagine everything. Like, I love this character, man. This character has has represented like all the values that I've tried to live my life by. Like from the time that I could even walk, I got so much Superman stuff. Like, you know, on my walls, you know, I have my name, I have my last name, the initial of my name, carved in, you know, out of in some wood. I mean it was a it was a, a woodworking project in a Superman crest. And they're hanging on my walls. I love that character. I love the incident. I'm wearing a Superman t-shirt right now to record this, to get into the essence of this episode. And I never, from the time, the first time I saw this character, even the racist 1932 cartoons, even those, I never looked at the character and said, man, that character doesn't look like me. I hate him because he's white. No, I just love the characters, the truth, the justice. All these things that shouldn't be um, foreign. They're just American values. I'm as American as you are. But it, it, but it bears a deeper question, though. Like, we talk about fragility, but there's another thing going on, going on here. Like, is it, is it just racial arrogance? Like, how arrogant do you have to be to assume that, a, that an alien from another world has to be white? Like, has to be. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, anything could have came out of that pod. Like, this story is so... Familiar. It's been used time and time again. Everywhere from from you know Icon, who happened to emerge and become black, Martian Manhunter, last of his kind, who took on the persona of a black man. Shit, Goku from from anime. It was the same story. It's the same story. Strange visitor from another world comes down. With powers far beyond those of mortal mortal men, like it could have been anything. They're not human, but it's 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 severe arrogance to to assume 
that just because they come from another world, that means they got to be white. I mean, they've already taken some license with this in other areas. I mean, the 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 show Krypton, the the Zod family was black. General Zod, who is Superman's greatest nemesis, Kryptonian nemesis. So it's happened before. But I think just now, because we're in such a polarized, much more polarized environment, that people are looking for every single thing to be offended by. If this is a one off movie, a standalone movie, much like The Joker was, so what? Superman is a mantle. It's a mantle that can be worn. It can be picked up by anybody. Kenan Kong version, Chinese version of Superman. I don't remember the uproar over that. But why this? I think this is what we got to ask ourselves about, you know, in this, in this scape, of, you know, where do you fit in and where do I fit in? The one place that should be have room for all of us is the fictional world. This is art, man. Like art is objective. Art is what allows you to be able to retell your story and and visualize it in a completely new and different way. Like this is art. If we can't coexist peacefully in the world of art, we definitely can't do it out here in the streets. Because if you're sitting around and you're afraid that your daughter or wife or auntie or whatever mom is going to, you know, you know, be exposed to Michael B. Jordan's muscles on the screen flying around in a skin tight unitard with a big S on his chest and it's going to be lusting after him. Guess what, dude? I got news for you. It's probably already happening. Probably is already happening. This country is changing. It's going to change. Right now, we're about 60, 40 white to black. White to white to minority, not just black. 20 years from now, it might be the exact opposite. 60, 40 minority to white. And then, who knows, white people, you might be the ones fighting to make sure that versions of you are included in in art who knows it could be the other way around you know the decision makers and the people who make decisions in society from everywhere from politics to art to music to to popular culture could all be brown and here you are fighting for representation don't take the don't take the the fatalist view that you're always going to be on top nobody's always on top or no one's always in the front. You've the you've had a long run, yes. But it is inevitable that it's gonna change this way. But this is there, there should be a place where we can have a creative exchange of ideas and invoke our imaginations. should be this should be it so I think the challenge is going to have to be not if we can produce content around uh, racial representation because guess what I don't want to do tokenism I don't want to do tokenism I don't want to change a character just because I want to change a character's race just because I want to change a character's race. I don't want to do tokenism. Because just flipping a random character for no other reason is tokenism. It's taking, you know, my desire to be represented in this in 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 society as, you know, a joke, as a throwaway. You know. I don't want to do 
tokenism. Like, we see tokenism in politics. Republican Party, I'm talking to you. We see tokenism in politics. We see the fact that this country is, you know, nearly 50-50 or getting close to, you know, even racial demographics, yet the Republican Party just gets whiter and whiter and whiter. And you see the tokenism. Now, the funny thing is, is that I look around and you would think it would be different because there's a vast difference between what you see represented in the decision making Republican Party versus what you see in the punditry Republican Party conservative movement. Because I can turn on anything. I can go on Twitter and, you know, Instagram. I can go on TikTok. I can go anywhere and I can see black conservatives all over the place. As pundits. But you can't put them in office. Y'all can't run for office. I mean, some of these people have massive followings. You know, hundreds of thousands of Twitter followers, and hundreds of thousands of, you know, followers on Instagram and TikTok and everywhere else. And these people have massive followings. But you can't find a way to office. I mean, you can put them on TV. Just can't put them in office. And the question is, I mean, I see these people out here, and you're you're saying some pretty vitriolic stuff. But you can't run for office. Like those who have run for office have gotten their head torn off, like just destroyed, because they don't have a message, and they're getting used. By this ultra white, ultra right wing conservative movement, as cannon fodder, as as attack dogs, and so I don't want to do tokenism in my representation in comic books. It needs to fit. It needs to fit, or it needs to be a reimagining or reimagining. You know, the Joker movie was great. Why? Because the Joker movie wasn't attached to anything. This was just the telling of a story about a character from a different vantage point. We saw a reimagining of the Superman story with Brightburn. We saw it. I mean, it's it was a standalone movie. It wasn't attached to anything. But we all knew what it was. I mean, was it good? But we all knew what it was. This could be the same thing. But whether or not it's good, or whether or not it's uh, social justice, warrior-esque, whatever it is, the opposition and the hatred towards it, something that's just in a conceptual phase right now, doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense. And I think it speaks to a broader issue that we're having in society of um, racial fear and white fragility. That even a comic book character, the skin tone, which is just freaking ink. It's just ink. The skin tone triggers you to this point if we can't have this creative space where we can reimagine fictional characters from a multiverse we're going to struggle to deal with a diverse population that continues to diversify every day in our country Whatever version of Superman comes to the screen, I'm going to love it. Why? Because I love this character. It has been my favorite. It will continue to be my favorite. I read everything about it. I watch everything about this character. Whatever version it is, from Injustice to Calvin Ellis. And it shouldn't be controversial to the point 
Love the character in all of the, all of his iterations. I had to for decades. Put yourself in the shoes of someone who's a minority. Because if you live long enough, you're going to end up in those shoes anyway. How would you feel in a society where every single thing reflected did not reflect you? And every time that you got a little bit of representation, you were met with this kind of hatred and vitriol. How would you feel? This is the question that you got to ask yourself about how we exist together. Because if it can't happen in the multiverse, it can't happen anywhere. Open your mind, folks. Well, my friends, this has been episode nine, and I am continue to be overwhelmed by your support and your love. Um, you can find us on YouTube. You can find us on uh, Stitcher. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Pandora, um, Spotify, everywhere. Like anywhere that we have uh, Buzzsprout, you can find us anywhere. And so um, next episode will be um, the season finale, and we're going to discuss uh, WandaVision. Now, I've, obviously, WandaVision was a huge uh, MCU hit, but we're going to discuss WandaVision and the crafting of alternate realities and politics. So um, stay tuned, join us, um, share with a friend, continue to like, and um, be open to new ideas, guys. Be open to, to, to change and be open uh, to a diverse world. It's a beautiful one. And, um, you know, in the words of my guy, kal uh, I'm about to get up, up, and away. Until next time, this is Superhero Politics, and I'm your host, Michael Holmes. What's going on, True Believers? Thank you for your continued and growing support. Uh, If you're enjoying the content that we're producing here on Superhero Politics, I ask that you subscribe anywhere that you can find podcasts. That means iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. Uh, You can find us at Buzzsprout uh, and also on our social media at Superhero Politics on Twitter at Superhero Politics on Facebook, Superhero Politics on Instagram, and Superhero Politics on TikTok. Um, like, share, join us. And if you would have any uh, topics that you would like to share or just questions that you would like to ask me, uh, you can send your emails to SuperheroPolitics at gmail.com and uh, we'll do an episode where we answer your questions. Thank you for your continued support. And remember, always speak truth to power.